Okay, so for anyone at home, uh, you didn't miss much. So welcome aboard. Let us keep going though. So, okay, I was just showing how um, we had this large windstorm as I think everyone here probably knows last spring and uh, that really changed the complexion of a lot of our forests. Um, certainly, I don't think we wanna take the approach that you just, uh, you know, torch the earth and start over with our woods. You know, windstorms are actually a natural process, right? So climate change or not, they happen. And this derecho, you could argue, maybe was more likely to happen based on the windstorms and things that we're getting, but um, more of on the climate change that we're getting and things. But that being said, uh, it could have happened anyway. Now, I just, I, I kind of want to hide this uh, bar. Anyone know? Anyone know how to do that? How do I hide this thing? I can just leave it. You don't see my titles too well, though. Okay, that's fine. All right. I'll read it from this monitor. So uh, also very, very recently, right, April 5th, uh, we had uh, quite the ice storm, didn't we too? And so this photo was taken only a few blocks from here on, uh, I guess on Bellevue Avenue in, uh, in Ottawa here. And um, that's a, a Norway maple that split in half. And uh, just to show again, how again, trees can be really here today, gone tomorrow. Uh, Norway maple, you could argue actually is an invasive species and I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I like all trees. I don't want to see any trees get injured or whatever, but this one, this is not like losing a rare native species. It's kind of different, but um, yeah, this is the homeowner, you know, they don't know what they're going to do kind of thing. And it's just, it's unfortunate, right? There's a lot of damage. Uh, my, my house, which is not too far away as well. Also, we lost our tree, which was a silver maple, one of the weakest wooded trees and luckily didn't damage any property, but it more or less fell apart. <laughs> so. Um, I'm going to recommend people in general to uh, consider, if you don't do it already, to document nature because there's so many of these open questions and so many things are changing rapidly. And uh, I'm an active participant on uh, the Citizen uh, Science Database iNaturalist, a uh, little screenshot of me there. And I'm also, yeah, as you already know, I'm the Vice President and Chair of Conservation for the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club. Uh, so one of my main activities is like a hobby, uh, kind of a focus hobby, though, is to document our biodiversity uh, as it's changing, especially with a focus from my perspective, which I find interesting, which is the rare native species of plants uh, and other life forms. Also uh, emerging, naturalizing or even invasive species, I find that quite interesting too, because it's just changed in the other direction. And I also uh, kind of lead some projects on uh, monitoring uh, uh, in, in new, path, new pests of forests, which we'll talk a little bit, a little bit about too. So one project that I led on, and this is citizen science, uh, we might have a new invasive insect that affects the elms actually. And of course, elms already famously are affected by Dutch elm disease, right? So uh, if you see in the left photo, uh, my hand there is holding an elm leaf, American elm leaf, and there's a very pronounced zigzag uh, feeding trace there. So that's a insect that was only uh, documented in North America as in 2020 near Montreal. And in 2020, I just sort of happened to take a photo by chance of an elm leaf that had a feeding trace in Ontario at Voyager Provincial Park, which is, I don't know if you can see my cursor, this is Ontario here, you know, the northeastern tip of southern, southeastern Ontario as you get to Montreal, almost to Montreal. Um, all to say is um, in 2021 and also 2022, I'm showing you a map here of eastern Ontario, um, I led a project to just sort of drive around and hike around uh, when we're not driving and just look at elms and see if you see these feeding traces. Because if you see that feeding trace, you know you have that insect because it's a unique feature of this insect. And by doing just kind of a modest effort over one summer, we showed it was across the entire span of eastern Ontario. We looked a little bit more last year too. We found it as far west as the greater Toronto area. And also we went to New York, sorry, went to Vermont, pardon me. And the first American elm we looked at in Vermont had it. And that was news for the state. The state didn't realize that they had it when we found it. So uh, this thing's spreading very fast. And there's no, no, no idea yet what the effect will be, if any. But in Europe, where it has been, in, it invaded about 20 years ago, it has caused significant uh, damage to European elm species. So this may be yet another big issue for elm trees. Just to show kind of what I was doing in cases of interest. So on the, the left photo here, here's an American elm. I kind of sunrise and I was on Highway 31 here, just parked on the side of the road. And increasing zoom, if you look at skin of binoculars, just increasing zoom, you can, if you find the right leaf, you might find at this bottom leaf here, distinct feeding trace of that insect. So those are the kind of projects that we uh, we do with the Field Naturalist Club and they're really kind of get me uh, interested in uh, just studying change as it's happening with my within my lifetime here. 
Um, another one that uh, the Auto Film Naturalist Club is uh, kind of uh, helping out with, um, this is a big issue potentially too, well, definitely to our seventh big issue. Probably can't read my title too well, so I'm gonna read it for you. This is um, an invasive insect moving north, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. And this map, uh, which is not mine, and I think the credit's in the map there, anything that's not green is showing uh, this invasive insect is present. And this is a big problem for uh, Eastern hemlock. We, we probably a lot of you have seen what happened with ash trees in Ottawa when the ash borer came through. Think that, but possibly even worse for hemlock. Certainly to the south, it's been essentially it's exterminated hemlock from many of its uh, for, from many of its areas. And hemlock is a keystone ecological species that shades creeks for habitat for say brook trout and salamanders and things. And so this would be a real big issue if it gets here. Not on this map on the left here is actually uh, last year was in the news that the pest was discovered across on the northern side of Lake Ontario, near where my cursor is, uh, at Grafton, which is near uh, Coburg. And so the Autofield Naturalist Club, this is a bit outside of our normal area, but we're, we're basically scanning, uh, and we haven't found this thing yet, thankfully, the St. Lawrence area when we have time, and a little bit of the northeastern side of uh, Lake Ontario, just to see, you know, is this thing, is it even further afield? It is moving north kind of slowly, so I predict in the next you know few years we'll probably see it, and hopefully it's not as bad. As it's going north, it's not as bad as it's been to the south, thankfully, probably because of the shorter growing seasons and also the, the insect is not super cold tolerant as well. Anyway, just things to look out for, you know, lots of uh, citizen science uh, to look for. Um, this one, um, another project that we led on, uh, myself being the kind of driving force, was uh, documenting another tree. Remember I, I gave that swamp white oak example at the beginning? About 10 years ago, there was another tree example that was basically the same idea. Red spruce, major important conifer, was not really known to be in eastern Ontario as a wild species. All the red dots you're looking at are observations that I've made on a naturalist of red spruce growing wild, in my opinion, anyway. And the main kind of point, I guess, would be not only is it present, but it's present from like Ottawa to Voyager Provincial Park in like a span of 100 kilometers. And so again, this is a famous species that's very well known, just in general, like for forestry and even horticulture. And uh, it's growing wild in terms of num numbering into the thousands of mature trees in eastern Ontario. And that wasn't known like 10 years ago. Just to kind of give you an idea of what, what other questions might be out there. <laughs> just to show what red spruce looks like, um, just two mature examples. The tree on the left was a double trunk tree. And I say was in past sense because that actually did get blown down with the derecho. May 22 last year. So that tree is now on the ground, unfortunately. The tree on the right was a tree that kind of led to a intense search because that one was found some distance away from a little population that we noticed. And it really got us thinking there's gotta be more. And just, we sort of kept looking and then found this 100 kilometer stretch. Uh, from a horticulture perspective, I think red spruce is a great looking tree, uh, very lime green, kind of lustrous foliage, glossy kind of look. Um, to me, it's most, again, this is an opinion thing, but to me, it's probably the most attractive of our spruces. And interestingly, it's almost never planted, like, like really almost never. Um, and there's no good reason for that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a full size conifer and we plant all sorts of other conifers like white pine, red pine, et cetera, and white spruce commonly too. So uh, uh, one push of this product, which I hope is the results is uh, maybe red spruce will finally get kind of planted around Eastern Ontario a bit uh, in, in appropriate habitat. Because it's, uh, I think it's attractive and we, in terms of gardens, right, like kind of the European perspective of a garden being the entire yard, not just your little flower bed, definitely needs to be an important uh, tree to include in our gardens. Just give a little bit more of an example of kind of the, the work that we did because uh, I spent a lot of time on this and just a lot of my life has gone into this in the last few years. On the left, just the title page of a report that we filed with Voyager Provincial Park for Ontario Parks. We showed that Red Spruce is in Voyager Provincial Park, which wasn't known previously. And just on the on the right is a photo of two red spruces here, one there, one there, and then a more familiar conifer to most people probably eastern hemlock. They often grow together. They're both very long lived and shade tolerant, have kind of similar ecological function. And just a couple of slides ago, I mentioned how hemlock might have its fate and kind of in trouble long term here because of this this insect that's moving from south to north. That's an invasive species that threatens hemlock's existence long term. Red spruce, at least so far. There's no major pests to worry about. So actually, the importance of red spruce may be much uh, heightened over time, ecologically anyway, if hemlock, for example, were to be kind of, uh, you know, high, heavily impacted by that uh, invasive uh, H double wave that's moving north. Just giving one final kind of example of the kind of things that we do um, from the roadsides, because often you have private property and you can't trespass, right? So 
On the left with a red arrow, you might see like a little dark lump there. That's me sitting at the edge of the road with um, a, a red spruce that we believe we spotted. And using a fairly inexpensive, uh, but a very high zoom point and click camera, not a DSLR, but like just a super high zoom, like 125 times time zoom camera, you can actually get really pretty much like diagnostic images of that is a red spruce, it's a rare species and blah, blah, blah. And that's probably, you know, close to three or 400 meters away kind of thing. Just to show the kind of things you can do, even uh, from public property, looking onto private property, if you just want to be respectful and just observe what might be there and you can't have a permit to go look. So yeah, for example, to tell that this tree on the right, this is a red spruce, the same one you're looking at on the left, but you can see it better here. The dark green color without kind of a grayish tinge, say white spruce have a grayish tinge. Uh, if you know Norway spruce, um, that's very similar for color, but of course Norway spruce has cones roughly the size of the microphone I'm holding, you know, like banana sized cones. Red spruce has little egg shaped cones, fairly broad growth form. And uh, so you look at the color, the growth form, the cones, et cetera. And uh, yeah, the tree on the right, that photo is good enough to be essentially 100% sure that's a red spruce, if you know the species well. Yes? Oh, and if you go back to slide number 13, where you have young, young one, the, the one on the left, the branches go down, the one on the right, they go up, and they're a different color. Do you say that's the same species? Yeah, it's the same species, and I, I would actually say it's the same color, but different lighting conditions I probably photographed them in. I'll, I'll give a brief... Uh, yeah, example of uh, what, what I think is going on here though. So the tree on the left is significantly larger than the tree on the right. And you did say the one on the right was younger, right? The one on the left would be like, you know, the final phase of its life, like mature, pushing probably 150 plus years old. Uh, the one on the right is early maturity. So it's maybe only two thirds as tall. And it just recently became about two thirds as tall. The one on the left is not really growing tall anymore. It's done. The one on the right is still actively going up. And it hasn't it hasn't been high enough to have broad branches at the top yet, but over time it should turn into effectively like the one on the left. And yeah, the color is basically the same, but you have, the lighting is different. So for for these examples, I also have super high zoom photos which help show the color, but I am not showing them in this uh, talk. You're just seeing the zoomed out photos. Good question. Okay. Uh, just to give some other examples, I, I kind of recommend people be uh, mindful when they're walking around because there's surprises everywhere. Again, I'm trying to give this as a theme tonight. So on the left, uh, we have silver buffalo berry. And I only observed that last autumn by kind of just walking around uh, Woodruff in some of the green, kind of the interior Greenbelt area. And that's the first record for the city of Ottawa ever seen as a wild plant. So just by kind of walking on a random trail, oh, look, this has never been seen in Ottawa before. On the right, also dwarf strawberry bush, which is a euonymus species. Um, that's the second record that I know of for Ontario. That's at Fletcher Wildlife Garden, so it could be introduced there, like planted. But we have seen it almost for sure growing wild at Gillies Grove in our prior. Anyways, that, the one on the right, the dwarf strawberry bush, is considered exceedingly rare in North America. That's like record number two or three for Canada kind of thing, or at least, and um, uh, also for North America, because there's, there's, I think essentially no records in the United States of a wild plant for that one on the right. So just, you know, kind of pay attention and there's all sorts of things. Uh, again, I, I think a lot of this is under sampled. So like, there's obviously more than three uh, of the one on the right in North America, but like in terms of observations where you have a location and a photograph, like number three. <laughs> so definitely you can have a notable find if you're out there. Um, last weekend, I gave a tour uh, for Old Ottawa South um, and a very surprise find for me in a back alley. So uh, that tree at center, not going to show very well. The photo's not great, but I just wanted to show the idea. That's a rock elm, and that's a pretty uncommon to rare species of uh, elm tree that's native here and declining heavily from uh, disease. It also declined historically from human uh, cutting. It's pretty much the most valuable timber tree that we probably had historically. Uh, big tree, very, very strong wood, kind of like hickory strength, but bigger than hickory in terms of size. And that was just growing in an alley uh, and like, you know, basically in, in a border with fence and it looks very not planted. So um, I've known of a few of them around there, but that was again, a kind of a notable find with, you know, planted spruce on the left and a Manitoba maple on the right, but a really interesting tree in the middle. You kind of never know what you're going to stumble into. So I recommend just uh, always keeping an open mind. On that theme of interesting elms, I think people aren't very familiar with their other two species, so I thought I'd show a couple of examples of them. Uh, the tree on the left, but in, in full leaf here during the summer, is a might be the biggest rock elm that's known standing today on Earth. That's in Merrickville, and that tree's, uh, when I measured it 10 years ago, was 92 feet tall and three and a half feet diameter, and it's only bigger now. 
And um, that looks to be like 200, 250 plus years old. It's huge, huge, the biggest tree in the town. And it also, the growth form on it appears to be from the original forest. It has a long straight trunk as if trees were once around it and they were cleared and kind of you keep one tree when you build a mansion kind of thing. You know, this, this brick house here is called the Percival House, which is effectively like a, the town's mansion, pretty cool house too. Um, and the tree on the right, I just want to show how non-elm like that looks. That's a slippery elm. And that might be the most misidentified tree in East North America. I find for some reason, very few people know what it actually looks like. So I try to show it when I can. And um, I think most people are familiar with elms having kind of that graceful vase appearance. This is a typical mature slippery elm on the right, and they're not very common. And that one's at Mooney's Bay, right beside the Terry Fox Athletic Facility on Riverside Drive. It's another wild tree, I think, that's just there from historical times. Okay. Another interesting one is um, we have a lot of bur oak around Ottawa and red oak too. Um, I, I already gave the example of swamp white oak earlier. I also wanted to show this. This was a real surprise from uh, early winter, just 2022. I was driving near Reveler Conservation Area, which is near the Canamore Orchard or kind of, you know, between Embrun and uh, was it Finch and Chrysler, that kind of area. And this tree had its leaves on and had white, whitish bark. And I'm like, oh, that's a white oak. And um, it's on just a rural road. And the tree to the right is a dead green ash. Green ash, of course, dying back from ash borer. Uh, if you look at Google Street View, there was actually green ash kind of all over here in this oak was sort of in the middle. And it looks to be a wild plant. And that's a very isolated, if it is a wild white oak, like there's no other mature white oaks known within like tens of kilometers of there. So that's kind of interesting. Again, could have been planted, but it, there's no evidence really that it was planted and looks to be kind of wild actually. So don't know. Uh, another weird oak, I'm being a bit oak heavy tonight, but oak, uh, what's not to like about oaks, they're really cool, right? So here's one that has not oak-like leaves, and I'm, I'm even trying to show things that I hope uh, you haven't seen all this before. So shingle oak is native just south of Canada, sort of like, you know, uh, Ohio and south, just south of Lake Erie. And uh, it's an oak that actually has just willow-like leaves, just like straight leaves without any oak-like wavy shapes or anything. And this is actually growing in Ottawa's Greenbelt, this particular sapling here. And um, again, there's, there's no other shingle oaks known to be growing wild within like hundreds of kilometers. And my suspicion for the, to explain how this tree kind of got there, the Dominion Arboretum is only about 10 kilometers away. And the acorns are small and perhaps, you know, blue jay or something maybe was at the Arboretum and then took it to fly and maybe drop an acorn, like who knows, right? But very kind of odd find for uh, the Southeast Greenbelt. Uh, an oak that's not even native to Canada, but native just south of Canada and not planted too often here. So just a little bit of a kind of spiel. So the native species, I think pretty much everybody knows our well-known species, and we tend to see them planted again and again and again and again. I get kind of bored because it's the same thing again and again. And I'm going to argue, who cares, if I, who cares if I'm bored, right? But maybe from a conservation perspective, it's just eh, a little questionable, right? So we, we plant sugar maple again and again and again, and red oak and bur oak and white pine and red pine and white spruce. I like all those trees. That's great that we're planting them. But we have like... Uh, you know, multiple times that number of species of, of nice trees as well that we don't plant. And so we'll, we'll spend a bit of the talk going through other trees that maybe you've either never heard of or just don't know too well, hopefully. There's, there's also a few that we plant again and again that are exotic as well. Uh, these are some of them, Norway maple, English oak, Scots pine, Austrian pine, blue spruce, and Norway spruce. They're kind of just, they're just planted everywhere. And it's a little odd to me uh, that we don't like spice it up a little bit. So <laughs> I'm not talking much about non-native species tonight, but uh, yeah, it's just uh, there's sort of like a half dozen of natives that we plant and kind of a half dozen of non-natives that we plant again and again everywhere. Um, bit of a wordy slide, but I thought I'd just get some ideas out there if I haven't said them already. Uh, a lot of our biodiversity is not that well known. Uh, so some trees that are lesser known to kind of casual people anyway, things like balsam fir, bitter hickory, hemlock, beech, basswood. And then you get kind of the, the more or less unknown types around Ottawa, like the red spruces and pitch pines and rock and slippery elm, black maple, compare that to sugar maple, for example, peach leaf willow and swamp white oak. Although swamp white oak in recent years is being planted more intentionally, which is kind of nice to see. We have dozens of native tree and shrub species, many of which are basically not planted, uh, kind of ever. And so that might lead to some questionable or precarious conservation statuses long term, right? Because if you constantly are developing the land, clearing forests, and you're never planting anything back from those forests, you're, you're going to get sort of a, con a mass conversion of genetics of each species, right, over long periods of time. I think we're seeing that starting, uh, if not now, probably starting previously even. 
the combination of so the combination of continued habitat loss and rare intentional plantings of many of our species is just yeah leading to potential extirpation of species from our forests. You know, imagine you have a, a field that stops being mowed and then trees or shrubs have to move into it from somewhere. If the neighborhood has like only you know one fifth of the, the, the species that it should, the seeds have nowhere to come from, right? So it can be very difficult to get them back through uh, natural uh, progression through the, uh, you know, from uh, you know, pioneer to climax, right, the succession. Uh, and so just being aware, I think is step one, right? Like, do these species exist? And some of them are pretty charming looking. I guess I'm trying to be a bit of an ambassador tonight to show some of them and how they can uh, be kind of cool looking. Uh, a website I recommend to check out if you've never seen it before is Global Forest Watch. Uh, this, this is basically satellite imagery showing forest change over the last 20 years or so, and you can customize the times that you show. But the point being, if you see green, it's forest. If you see pink, it's forest loss within the last 20 years. And blue, dark blue, not rivers, but like, you know, the navy blue would be forest regrowth. There's a lot of pink you can see kind of zooming out. I recommend if you like go on this website, just scroll around planet Earth, you might find some interesting trends. You'll see, I think generally it's much more loss in gain. If you are losing forest, you might lose a forest that's 500 years old or 50 years old or who knows, right? If you gain forest in the last 20 years though, by definition, you're only gain, gaining forest that's 20 years or, or less old, right? So gaining and loss, loss actually could be much more severe as well, right? Because you might lose something that took centuries to or more to build. And just to show near my hometown of Russell here, uh, there's a lot of clear cutting happening. It's been in kind of the news a little bit lately, you know, like uh, some of the projects are in the Southeast Ottawa and things. So here's Russell. And then I noticed this forest all of a sudden looked like it was kind of gone from the inside out driving along the road. And you can use Global Forest Watch to confirm, you know, what you already kind of knew. She's like, yep, looks like pink from the inside out and a little bit of green strip to try to hide it from the edge, right? And that's very, very common with a lot of the development that's occurring. And other, other blobs of pink of forest loss just sort of all over the place too. So if you just want data to see what's actually happening, this is an excellent website to see what kind of losses and where they're at. Uh, I find white cedar fascinating. Uh, red cedar, the juniper can also do this too, but like white cedar has a very, very slow uh, rate of decomposition. And so it's very common to be even like, you know, to see a, a wetland at kind of a low water level or even hiking on a hill. And you might just see these old ancient stumps that are white cedar, and they could be from, you know, they last more than a century. So a lot of these, if they're looking especially very weathered and kind of thin, there's a good chance they're from the 1800s. Most of the clear cutting in the Ottawa area appears to have happened roughly 1830 to 1900, right? The kind of go, going from full forest to more or less no forest. And then a lot of forests regrew since then has been kind of growing and cutting back since then. So a lot of these stumps actually appear to be from that original wave, you know, circa 1870, and they're still around, you can see them. <laughs> Sometimes you find cedar stumps and you don't find living cedars in the area. And that's, to me, I find that very interesting. No, the point would be that pretty much every other kind of tree, except for maybe red cedar, which is another cypress, they're cut down within a few decades. It's just, there's no evidence, they're just gone, right? Whereas the, the cypresses, these cedars, there's evidence for, you know, over a century. Is there a question? Yes, I was just wondering, the Global Forest Watch, how often is that updated? I think it's updated about every year or two. So it's so right now it's 2021. I think they're kind of on a cycle. They're probably going to update again soon. So you're not going to see something that happened in 2022, but you'll see something that happened in 2019, right? And so very useful tool still, right? And often for big blocks of forest, if you're concerned about a larger block, it takes time to cut them down. <laughs> so you kind of sometimes see like partly cut and then more cut the next year and et cetera. Very useful tool. The Taggart um, incident there with the two men land was recently. Uh, there. That's correct. So right now, uh, the Global Force Watch would not show that. It would show it as being green still because it hasn't updated to reflect the loss that occurred. Yeah. Okay. Uh, trees can be endangered. Probably you know that, but I'll just show a paper from uh, 2006, and the actual work was done in 2003, 20 years ago that concluded that over half of our species in Canada requires some active conservation that they're not getting uh, and have kind of endangerment encroaching upon them. Like they're threatened over half or recommended action to uh, recommended action to like genetic conservation or habitat preservation so that they don't become increasingly endangered over time. I can tell you in the last 20 years, it's not gotten better. And actually Eastern species, Eastern North America was worse than Western North America. So that 52% includes the Western Canadian trees in the east, it's more like 60% or something that are threatened 20 years ago with conservation issues like, you know, endangerment or at least threatened status. 
preaching to the choir here, but there's a big debate in horticulture, especially maybe more historically about uh, what's going on in terms of invasive potential, things like that. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight too. Um, in terms of what is native, like what's native to Ottawa, um, that's a very good question, right? So um, I'm not going to pretend that I'm the authority on this, but I've thought a lot about it. And um, something that makes sense to me is you have an eastern forest, right? Like there's a, this is just showing the United States, but of course, I'm not far north of that. You have the Great Plains and the prairies to the west, to the north in Canada, you know, like the northern parts of the prairie provinces in northern Quebec and Ontario. You get the boreal forest, which stretches kind of almost like coast to coast. But in terms of our area, the kind of, you know, temperate zone, you've got an eastern forest and you've got a western forest, Rocky Mountains kind of in the west, right? And they're they're separated by Great Plains. In terms of glaciation and kind of, you know, uh, you know, migration cycles of plants and things, if you plant almost anything from the east that within kind of what I'm showing here, you know, like Appalachian Mountains and things, if it was going to be super invasive historically anyway, it probably would already be here, right? Because it had a chance to get it on its own. So my, at least my naive perspective is not to worry too much if you move a plant from, like that shingle oak I showed earlier, if it happens to get here from Ohio somehow with a planting at the Arboretum and it spreads from an acorn, probably not going to be a big problem because it's already in Ohio where we have sugar maple there too, right? And things like that. Whereas if you plant plants from East Asia, Western Europe and Western North America, there's really, we don't, we don't really know what's going to happen, right? Because you're sort of opening a Pandora's box and there's no ecological history of a lot of these plants here. And you just, you'll see what happens once you do it. <laughs> we don't really know what's going to happen typically. I'll just show some typical ranges of, of trees. Like you know, one species, American elm, which I'm showing here, basically ranges throughout the entire Eastern forest from uh, Saskatchewan to Nova Scotia to Florida to Texas, just everywhere. Some other trees are much more specialist. So white spruce I'm showing here, just is the boreal forest across Northern Canada and a little bit of the States, including Ottawa. These are all around Ottawa. Shoei Mountain Ash, which is another, it's an Eastern species that's boreal, but doesn't go to the Western boreal forest. This one is barely in the Ottawa area, kind of like Gatineau Park in North. Very attractive tree, which I didn't show any photos of tonight, but boy, it's, it's, it's Latin name is Decora for decorated and it's common name is Shoei and they're not kidding. It's really beautiful. So if you have a cool place in your garden, that's a good one to think about. Yeah, that's a northern plant. And then you've got southern plants like black walnut, which barely stretches in eastern Ontario around Prescott, like a little kind of isolated population there. Common in Ottawa now from planting. And red spruce already showed, uh, this is an older map, which showed it kind of on the Quebec side of the Ottawa River and just an eastern tree that extends in the southern uh, Appalachian Mountains. And then another one, peach leaf willow, is basically a prairie tree, which extends up into eastern Ontario and is more or less absent from New England. It's like if you go to like Vermont, it's pretty much gone. New Hampshire it is gone, I think, essentially. Um, okay, so in terms of some ideas for like uh, changes that are occurring, I thought I'd show what we're just seeing if you walk in the woods today. So for example, this tree that's still green, the little red circle around it is nori maple, and that's invaded a mature woodlot and growing under like sugar maple and other native species. Something you see all the, a lot is um, trees often from other places stay green longer than trees that are native here. And I have kind of a rule of thumb. If it's green after Halloween, pretty much likely not native to Ottawa area or not even East North America typically. So this tree would have been like, you know, roughly, you know, Halloween or maybe just before or just after, still bright green. And that reflects, of course, it's the home area being, you know, Gulf Stream Europe, warmer, uh, mild autumns that last longer. So it's saying, hey, why, what's so bad about November? I should still be green. Same, same idea here in the background, hard to see, but there's trees turning yellow. And this is cathartic buckthorn growing in a school fence. Everybody probably knows about buckthorn here. Just showing, you know, this is sort of the Pandora's box you could open and you don't necessarily like what comes out of it sometimes. This is one of the most invasive plants in North America and it's everywhere in Ottawa. Um, it's still green in, in autumn. Possibly even worse, and here's a green plant with snow on the ground. This is glossy buckthorn. This might be even more invasive than cathartic buckthorn, but this was introduced later. So it's still is kind of spreading and still figuring out, I guess, how far it's going to get. Whereas the, the, the cathartic buckthorn I showed on the previous slide was brought in North America decades to maybe almost close to a century earlier. So it's already more or less spread where it's going to go. This glossy buckthorn, if you go between major cities, like halfway between Ottawa and Montreal, it's hard to find actually. But in Ottawa, where people were planting in these big cities, it's pretty much invaded everything now in the last couple of decades. Still green with snow on the ground. 
One, there's also trees that, you know, and shrubs that are pretty invasive looking that are not getting a lot of attention. It's sort of like emerging topics, right? So Japanese tree lilac, which probably a lot of you are familiar with, I'm going to make the argument that around Ottawa anyway, it's behaving very differently than the traditional common lilac. Japanese tree lilac appears to be very invasive in woods in Ottawa. This is an example here showing this sort of, you know, broad spreading shrub here, growing almost like a pagoda dogwood, this sort of tiered structure. Um, and certain woodlots in Ottawa, it's actually already the dominant shrub. And Japanese tree lilac, unlike the buckthorns, was planted much later. We're talking, you know, 1960s and kind of on, like last 50 or so years, it's been commonly planted and it's already spreading aggressively into woods. And it has very little status right now, but I think this might be one that in the long term might be kind of like the next buckthorn, if we're not careful. At least it's prettier than buckthorn. Also, some, some trees that we don't often talk about, but like Norway spruce appears to be highly aggressive as well as a conifer. Um, and uh, that doesn't get a lot of press. But for example, if you like white pine, uh, red, Norway spruce seems to basically be better at white pine than white pine is in forests. It's more shade tolerant. It's very tall, like white pine. And it aggressively colonizes forests, whereas white pine uh, often doesn't aggressively colonize forests. Here's that dwarf strawberry bush uh, that I mentioned earlier. This is the really, really rare one. This, this photograph was taken under the tallest tree in Ontario at uh, Arnprior, Gillies Grove. So just to show, we have an old growth woodlot in Arnprior, tallest tree in Ontario, and a bizarre invasive species right at its foot. So just, I find these things kind of, well, kind of funny and fascinating. Now, how about some pretty things that are uh, native that are rarely planted that you might want to consider planting? Uh, so Redora, this is far east Ontario. This is actually east of Ottawa. So Ottawa is pretty much, I guess you might say, kind of barely not native, but it is native at like Alfred Bog, Newington Bog, uh, Morwood Bog, and other like other bogs kind of just east of Ottawa, but not Marabla, not known for Marabla. One of the most pretty plants in North America. In fact, the journal for New England botany is called Rodora because it's common in New England, common in the uh, Atlantic uh, Canada provinces as well and just gorgeous when it's flowering. So this will flower in about a month from now. And uh, I recommend uh, checking it out in person. It's very pretty or even planting it. This is critically endangered in Ontario because it's such a small part of Ontario that it's native to. It's an S, we call it an S1, like a one, meaning it's here, but like the lowest rank, a zero would be like extinct in the province. So it's a one. Both of these plants, these are two herbaceous plants I'm showing here. On the left, you've got Canada lily near Cornwall, also Far East Ontario. That's a, also a, a critically endangered plant in Ontario. And on the right, you got greater purple fringe orchid, also critically endangered in Ontario. But again, because of the far eastern tip of Ontario is the only place that they're known in the province. So for Canada lily, uh, likes growing in floodplains. So that photo was taken right beside the St. Lawrence River at Cooper Marsh Conservation Area. And on the right, the greater purple fringe orchid likes coniferous swamps, things like that. So uh, beautiful plants. If you want to photograph the orchid, uh, like many orchids, you're taking your uh, life in your hands almost with the mosquitoes because uh, June is often when they're uh, flowering and that's sort of peak bug season, but uh, I'd say it's still worth it if you find them. And the, the Canada lily is almost like a Canada day plant. Its peak flower seems to be around July 1st. That photo was taken roughly July 1st. There's also plants on the west side of Ottawa that you don't really, you barely don't have in the Ottawa area too. So hairy honeysuckle, which is an attractive native vine, very hairy, well-named, almost like mullen, like very velvety leaves, uh, is a vine that we have, you know, sort of like the Canadian shield, kind of Calabogie in that area just west of Ottawa. And black oak, which I'm a big fan of, uh, like all the oaks, uh, native just, well, not just west of Ottawa, but kind of like the uh, Belleville and north of Lake Ontario area around there. It grows well in Ottawa if you plant it, but it's rarely planted here. Very shiny leaves, kind of an interesting look for the black oak. Uh, Canada plum is one that I'm a huge fan of as well. So this uh, is a pretty reasonably common but, uh, plant in our fence rows and kind of agricultural areas. Uh, the, the fruit, in my experience, tastes very good. And um, those four that I collected, the fruit there, I got four plants out of that. And they also have nice tasting fruit. So it seems to be, it seems to be onto something here. Uh, so um, I recommend Canada plum as something that maybe think about if you wanted a native species of a cherry or a plum. I'll show a photo of it flowering later. It's, it's a cherry, you know, or a plum. You know, they're, they're, all, they're all very attractive. It's a prunus, right? They're all, they're all pretty. We have our own kind of cherry festival here, right? The, the native species, maybe Canada plum. <laughs> um, how about a native buckthorn? So if you wanted to uh, maybe trick some of your friends and they're like, hey, uh, here's, here's my buckthorn collection. 
I would say the alder leaf buckthorn is not strikingly beautiful, but the fruit on the right are pretty attractive, you know, multicolored and interesting. This is a bird shrub that's sort of like, you know, shin to knee high, likes growing in damp areas, kind of like, you know, cedar swamps and things like that. And um, it's pretty uncommon, actually. Like, it's not, it's widespread, but not easy to find. You'll find, you know, a thousand or more of the other two invasive buckthorns before, before you typically find one of these. And this is one I think that has some potential as being just, you know, a border plant and attractive fruit. The flowers are not much right home, but they're small and kind of green. But uh, yeah, all, all the way buckthorn, you can have a native buckthorn and uh, uh, be helping conservation. Uh, How can we distinguish that from the other? Sure. So this alder leaf buckthorn is very short, like I was saying. The other two will become taller than any of us in the room. Now, mind you, when they're young, it's hard to tell, but this one has no thorns as well. So this one looks more like the cathartic or the common buckthorn, the really common one that we often see in our fence rows and things. But this one has no thorns, unlike that one, right? Now, glossy buckthorn, if you're familiar with that, also has no thorns, but I'd say it looks rather different. It's like a different kind of cousin on a different part of the family that doesn't look that similar. So no thorns, pretty short, and it uh, likes wet areas, whereas the other, the, the other common or cathartic buckthorn tends towards drier places. Good for birds. Anything with these little sort of pea-sized fruit like that, that are brightly colored, it is definitely good for birds and just good for biodiversity in general. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is one, this color hasn't been changed here too. So in a, in a couple of weeks on the left, you'll have the Canada fly honeysuckle flowers. And we actually have like, I'm going to say six to 10 or something different honeysuckles that are native here. There's a whole bunch that are, that are native, rarely planted. Canada fly is one of the more common ones and very pretty. It has these uh, twin flowers, as you see here on the left. Again, look for that in early May or even late April if it gets, uh, if it stays warm. And then late May into June, you have these beautiful fuchsia is that the right word for the color? Like bright, bright red, uh, striking uh, pair of fruits that are sort of like a rugby or football shape. This is a, I'd say, high potential for ornamental use uh, in kind of borders and things. And in my experience, very rarely planted. And like I said, there's actually many other honeysuckles that we could plant that we don't plant too. This is just the one that I picked at, at random, more or less. Um, the hollies. Now, the one on the left, winterberry, I think is commonly planted. So I guess I'm kind of cheating a little bit here. But how about the one on the right, mountain holly? The fruit look almost like a little crab apple or like a service berry, but they uh, they retain like a long time like a crab apple, not like a service berry. And I find they're both rather attractive plants for wet areas. And the mountain holly, especially, is considered a rare plant in the Ottawa area, although it's not that rare. And uh, I find it quite pretty. The twigs are actually purple. I'm not coming across on the photo, but purple twigs, nice little flowers, attractive fruit. What's not to like? That's mountain holly and bitterberry holly. Uh, we have a beaked hazelnut as a native species here and also rarely American hazelnut. I'm showing uh, two examples from far east Ottawa region around Cornwall, Cooper Marsh Conservation Area and Torbolden Forest, West Ottawa. Uh, this species is pretty ornamental in my opinion. Uh, very hairy, if you like plants that have some fuzz on them. It's got that for sure. The one on the left is very fuzzy. But the one on the right is showing the autumn color and the autumn color is actually uh, pretty bright red and purple and orange. And so American hazelnut, unlike beet hazelnut, is also very attractive uh, in autumn. And so again, just you know, probably most people have heard of the hazelnuts and kind of know about them, but there's, there's some rare native species you can plant and help conservation as well. Um, a good alternative for say Austrian pine would be pitch pine. So pitch pine is one of these ones that's uh, native just near Ottawa and Montreal, um, but doesn't go any further north. So this one, pitch pine I'm showing here, on the left, there's two examples along the St. Lawrence River on the Thousand Islands Parkway. It's native from roughly uh, Brockville to Gananoque and a bit north like Charleston Lake and grows well if you plant it here. The one on the right is actually at the Dominion Arboretum and turning into a full nice looking pine. So if you, if you like uh, kind of stocky looking pines uh, compared to say red and white pine, which grow taller and are more airy looking. Uh, pitch pine is, uh, in my opinion, attractive and uh, pretty high potential for um, you know, climate change, hotter summers and things like that. This is a southern tree that's sort of at its limit. And if we move it a bit north, it might, uh, we might benefit from it actually. Um, just my red spruce again, in case you hadn't seen that. So just showing another one you already know. 
Swamp White Oak, I showed the one on the left as my kind of title slide, but the one on the right is another nice example growing near Brinston. And we found, uh, you know, dozens of examples in between. So just to show again, this is a species that's in the last few years has been planted around Ottawa a little bit, but now you can plant it and say, hey, it's native too. And it's very attractive. The leaves are, it's, it's called uh, bicolor for the scientific name because the leaves are like two different colors, white on one side and dark green on the other. Kind of like silver maple, but better. And um, the bark peels on the branch is almost like a birch. It has very peely bark. So I find them quite interesting and attractive looking. Of course, that's subject to opinion, but uh, they're kind of neat. If you want it, if you're getting sick of broken red oak, this is a good one to check out. The willows, if you have wet spots, a lot of our big willows in the Ottawa area are uh, weeping willow, which is exotic. And of course, crack willow, which is an exotic species too. Those really big, you know, meter thick diameter willows that are not weeping are typically crack willow or sometimes white willow. But we have native willows that are tree size too. Uh, black willow on the left is usually a spreading tree, kind of like crack willow. And if you like tall, narrow trees, almost like Lombardi poplar, peach leaf willow, I probably didn't get the two best examples there for attractiveness. They can be very... Uh, elegant looking too, but they typically are tall and narrow, almost like a slightly wider, not the Lombardy poplar. So I find peachy willow pretty striking. If you have a wet area and you want a tall, narrow tree, it turns into a full size tree and it's uh, grows fast and uh, pretty nice looking at the same time, I'd say. Uh, as an alternative to sugar maple, I like sugar maple, who doesn't, right? But um, this photograph was taken in Oxford Mills, which is a little town uh, not too far from Kempville. And uh, this is a pattern I've seen repeatedly. You have a very healthy looking black maple, which is our kind of rare sub, not even subspecies or closely related species to sugar maple. This is a southern kind of interior, like Midwestern species that is native here, but less common at present than sugar maple. But it's considered more heat tolerant, more kind of roadside tolerant than sugar maple. Near that white house, which you probably can't see too well, there was actually a sugar maple stump from a, a dead sugar maple. And something I'm noticing in general is that black maple seems to thrive in cities and towns, et cetera, where the reputation for sugar maple is that it kind of doesn't. So something to consider as well. Black maple has this, the maple syrup potential, nice autumn color, a little bit less showy, but you know, nice oranges and yellows, a bit of red and big leaves, the much larger leaves that are velvety again. So it's a bit kind of an interesting tree to compare to sugar maple. If you have, if you have a with sugar maple, it makes a nice contrast actually. Okay. Again, a tree I'm going to say not many people know too well, slippery elm, which is highly medicinal. The tree on the left, again, showing a very non-elm-like growth form, almost like a white oak, like a spreading growth form. And the leaves on the right are large and often very folded and um, looks almost like a taco. That's one of the things we kind of say amongst ourselves, like the, the taco leaves. They're not always folded like that, but often they are. And they're very different from American elm, if you're familiar with that. Now, slippery elm is pretty uncommon, so you're, you're going to see probably like 98 American elms for, you know, out of 100, and then maybe two would be slippery elm. But it's a nice tree, very adaptable. The only downside would be there is some Dutch elm disease potential, but it's not guaranteed. And many of them make it to maturity. And sometimes this one here on the left is old age, actually. Just showing rock elm again. This is the same idea, much less common than American elm. The one on the left here is the second largest one that I've ever seen. This is in Hardington, Ontario. Um, nice leaves in autumn. They turn yellow on the outside first so it sort of has like almost like a like a coin appearance like there's something a very elegant looking in autumn sometimes and if you like gnarly looking trees like bur oak the one on the right is very quirky and gnarly and uh interesting looking they don't all do that but some of them are very uh thick quirk here's one that i hope you find striking if you've never seen it before this is heartleaf birch sometimes called mountain paper birch this is um very attractive for bark. And this is a tree, if you have kind of a cooler area, if you have a cottage of maybe in, you know, uh, in Quebec, you know, or Algonquin area, this, this tree doesn't like hot summers, but um, it's much more attractive if you like color in your bark anyway, than say paper birch, if you want some like coppery, bronzy, uh, eh, coppery tones. And um, see the way the bark is coming off there, a lot of trees wind up looking like that. It almost looks like just crazy looking, right? There's a huge amount of bark just piling up on the stem there. So this is a native tree that gets almost never talked about. And um, it's another kind of Northern tree, but if you have a cooler area, uh, well worth the uh, the effort to track them down. I'm not sure if it's really much in the trade at all, but I think I, I predict it will be a future in the trade kind of tree if it's not already, because like, look how the strike net bark appearances. So that's Hartley Birch. Uh, so yeah, if you want to find these trees and kind of get to know them. So I just showed three books that are worth checking out. Probably a lot of you have seen these before, especially the one on the left. Uh, trees in Canada is the de facto standard, you know, trees in Canada book today, quite good. 
The, the book in the middle, Shrubs of Ontario, I would say is excellent. The only drawback is it's uh, it was published 40 years ago in the early 80s, and it's now um, hard to find. But uh, apart from that, it's just amazing. And the Growing Trees from Seed on the right is just one of many manuals you can get to uh, grow trees yourself. A lot of you probably grow wildflowers, tomatoes, things like that. Growing trees is just as easy, right? You just have to grow them. And they don't grow that slowly, typically. Like the, a lot of people say, oh, I want a tree in my lifetime. You get trees in your lifetime if you start them before you're 95 years old, you know. Um, okay, local forest to visit. I'm just going to give some examples of trees that maybe we haven't seen it uh, quickly, kind of a whirlwind tour to end things off. And so Carp Ridge, you've got jack pine, which is pretty rare in Ottawa, a northern tree. Um, a lot of people find jack pine kind of, you know, remote looking, you know, that, that was the Tom Thompson tree. I think that was famously painted, uh, the group of seven there. Um, I find them attractive, but uh, that's sort of the North American equivalent of Scots pine. And if you have a northern area, jack pine is sort of de facto standard. On the right, you have black ash, which has strikingly soft, quirky bark. If you've never touched black ash's bark, I recommend checking it out sometime. It's just uh, quite, quite the texture to it. Of course, black ash is threatened from that emerald ash borer as well, just like all the other ashes. Uh, this is uh, Cliffland. This is uh, near Flower Station, Ontario, a little bit uh, west of Calabogie. On the left might be one of the largest white cedars in the world. Uh, that tree is about three, uh, three and a half feet diameter. And I actually did a bit of research about that. And the largest ones that are known, that were accurately measured but previously, are basically the same size. And they were on Manitoulin Island and I think in the States and the Great Lakes area too. So they're all, this is roughly tied for being the largest white cedar that's known in the world. And on the right, this is a white oak growing at the top of a hill, showing how white oaks, especially white oak, especially likes to spread lots of horizontal branches. White oaks are very strong, unlike, say, typically a lot of the maples in the zone. Um, here's a sandy area. So Torbolton Forest at Constance Bay. You've got fragrant sumac on the left. There's other sumacs you can consider planting too. There's like uh, smooth sumac and shining sumac, which we have near here too. On the right, you've got sweet fern. A lot of these sandy dryland plants are very good to the nose. They smell really good. So fragrant sumac, it's in the name. It smells almost like a detergent. If you crush a leaf, it's beautiful. Sweet fern smells spicy, almost like a chai tea. Again, it's not all about the eyes. Even the nose can take uh, some, uh, some of this in if you have the right kind of plants. And again, these, these prairie plants are often uh, very smelly in a good way. Just showing a couple of flowers for completion. This is the same site, that sandy area at Torvalden Forest. You've got hairy pacoon, which is a uh, endangered plant in our region, and also butterfly milkweed, which is also endangered in our region. That's an orange flowering milkweed, which uh, you've probably seen garden centers in some gardens today, but that's a wild population that's known at uh, Constance Bay. Uh, Fitzroy Provincial Park, just showing slip realm again. The bark is quite different from the other realms too. Maybe more interestingly, you got bladder nut on the right with maybe some bladders forming at the top left here of this photo and the flowers here. If you've never seen bladder nut, it has attractive bark that's kind of like striped maple, like stripey bark, and it makes a fruit about the size of a golf ball, but looks like a patio lantern. And it can be quite a striking appearance, right? It's a, it's a tall shrub and little maintenance and very to me, attractive and interesting looking. Very rarely planted in my experience, but native around Ottawa and probably going to use more in the future as a horticultural plant. Gillies Grove, I already alluded to this. This is the, one of the few old growth forests we have left in the Ottawa area. Uh, famous for its white pines, including the tallest tree in Ontario. The one in the background is not the tallest tree, but it's one of several tall white pines in that forest. They're all about 130, 140 feet tall, 40 plus meters tall. And then you've got an old growth yellow birch here on the right. Just if you, if you like seeing kind of cool, interesting trees, that are peak potential for size and age, uh, going to these old growth forests can be very interesting. There's, there's big sugar maples and basswoods and hemlocks there too. Speaking of which, uh, oh, that'll come in a sec. Here we've got um, High Lonesome, uh, which is another uh, Calabogie area place. I wanted to show some spring phenomenon. So bitter nut hickory here is leafing out on the left. Bitter nut hickory is a little utilized tree as well, as are all the hickories. And they're almost like the oaks for value, very, very valuable for long life, strong wood, et cetera. So if you, have, if you are interested in uh, something that's not an oak, but you like oaks, I recommend bitternut hickory and shagbark hickory. And in spring, you get kind of a show of uh, the leaves kind of being attractive. I'm just showing a, a, also a uncommon herbaceous plant in our area. This is broadleaf sedge, which has an attractive kind of waxy coating, looks sort of like lily of the valley, but it's native and uh, rare. Shagbark hickory, uh, they can be found along the Ottawa River. So on the left, you've got a couple at the Elmer area. And on the right, you've got uh, Rockland area. And there's little like, there's little pockets of them right along the Ottawa River. 
before they kind of stop as you go north. They're not really common in the interior of eastern Ontario. If you get to a little south again towards Cornwall and then south Chesterville, they become just everywhere. But around Ottawa, it's really just the Ottawa River typically or south facing slopes sometimes too. Very shaggy bird, pretty. And again, that's like a heritage tree. Think oak quality. Uh, some of our little maples too. So we have two ornamental maples that are, they're native, but they look ornamental. One on the left is striped maple known for its stripy bark. That's kind of like a green candy cane, green and white. On the right, mountain maple looks kind of like a dogwood, red bark, nice flowers. These are shrubby, ornamental, pretty maples that are never become a big tree. Straight maple and mountain maple. And that was at McNamara Trail. They're, they're reasonably common in a lot of our forests. Uh, showing a butternut on the left, that's of course famous for being uh, you know, a tree of interest because it's endangered from a major disease called the butternut canker. They're still pretty common in the right habitat around Ottawa. Any kind of limestone soils, you tend to find them. Uh, but they are, their population is going down from the, the, the disease that they're afflicted with. It's a walnut tree. And on the right, uh, one of our mini dogwoods I could show is round leaf dogwood. I find them attractive. You're not going to see it well, but this green stem has little purple flecks everywhere. So if you, if you, a lot of our beauty of our plants, if you get up close and look at some of the details, including round leaf dogwood, very interesting purple streaks along this green stem. And it has blue fruit for a fruit, which is kind of cool too. Almost done here, just a few more things. So here's another old growth forest. This is Shaw Woods, west of Ottawa. You've got like 120 foot tall basswood here that's got a long clear stem, clearly an old growth tree on the right you know, 100 foot tall hemlocks, just beautiful, large trees. Again, it's a well-known old growth forest site that uh, I recommend checking out if you've not seen it. Here's the one that I find interesting. This is a Summerstown Forest near Cornwall. I've already alluded to black maple. You might be able to see black, if you know sugar maple well, you might see a bit here on the left how black maple differs. Leaves are, uh, you know, kind of more... Whoop, a little more kind of, you know, dull looking. They are larger if you see them side by side. You might not see it, but here you've got stipules too. The bud is actually encircled with like a, a vegetative growth. So very different looking from sugar maple if you see it. These ones here at Summerstown Forest are growing on a heavy clay. So if you have heavy clay soil and it's kind of wet, too wet for sugar maple, black maple would grow in heavy clays that are kind of wet. And the one on the right I like showing, it's one of my favorite plants to look at, but not to touch. Poison sumac, which probably almost all of you have heard of, doesn't look anything like poison ivy, and it's always, always, always in wet soil. You'll never find it if you're on not, you know, not in rubber boot country. And it's actually pretty rare. I've only seen it at two places around Ottawa. One is near Cornwall, uh, Summerstown Forest, and one is west of Ottawa near Elmont at Wolf Grove. So pretty hard to find, actually. And very strikingly pretty, in my opinion. Nice red pedioles, just interesting tree. Okay, another old growth forest, I decided to just quickly show this is a little woodlot that has big oaks. So if you want to see really big oaks near Cornwall, this is Charlottenburg Park. And on the left, you've got an old growth red oak, and that's the size of my backpack for comparison. And on the right, you've got a, uh, oh, I wrote black, but I actually meant to write bur oak. I guess I just wrote black for some reason. So that's a red oak and a bur oak. Uh, both are old growth size and just beautiful in that uh, forest, Charlottenburg Park. Uh, Voyager Provincial Park, you've got red spruce, you've got rock elm, beautiful place to go for camping or just looking around. And then if you're interested in the tallest trees in Ottawa, uh, pretty much the same as Gillies Grove, just a, maybe a, just a smidge below. Uh, right behind the Bell Centennial Arena in the west end of Ottawa uh, are these white pines, which are all pushing roughly 130 feet tall or 40 meters, and they're still getting taller. So these are either young old growth or kind of small old growth or very old second growth. I think they're probably very, very, I think they're average old growth. Like they're just white pine that were probably never cut. They're very big and impressive if you've never seen them. Right behind the arena. A couple more to finish it off. Uh, I spent a lot of my time in the winter just admiring trees, the way that aesthetics, the way that they grow. So here's a population of hackberry in Smith's Falls at the locks there. Every tree you see there is a hackberry. And this is another one that's being planted increasingly because uh, it has no diseases and it's just easy to plant. And not, I would say very super ornamental, although the bark is pretty, but uh, they're being planted increasingly. If you want to see some old ones, Smith's Falls, Carlton Place, or Petrie Island are good places to see. And I showed earlier, you can find things behind other trees. So in winter, I look for conifers all the time. That red spruce thing I was doing earlier, I mentioned that it, it, when the leaves are out on the deciduous trees, forget it, you can't do it. Uh, now, I mentioned at the very beginning, I lost my tree in my front yard for that ice storm. I'm probably gonna replace it with a black oak. I find black oak even in spring, the leaves come out kind of pink and very velvety, kind of pretty. On the right, you've got red oak. 
which is the close relative that's planted in Ottawa. And um, I'd say variety is the spice of life. So why not add a really rare one into the mix? So I'll probably plant a black oak to replace the maple I lost. A couple more showy ones just to end off because this is a horticultural group, right? So at the Arboretum, you can find all sorts of crazy things that are pretty. Here's a red bud. This is, of course, native to the extreme southern tip of Ontario at like Point Pelee. And if you plant it in Ottawa these days with, I guess, climate change, winters are a bit milder, it actually does quite well. So you'll see a bunch of them starting to flower any time at the Arboretum. I thought I'd show this one, which is really rare. Here's an exotic that I'm kind of advertising. This is Korean abelia leaf, and this is considered really rare and endangered in Korea, where it's native. And I've only ever seen it flower one time, which was last week when I just walked by it and noticed it was flowering. So there you go. Sometimes it's called white forsythia because it looks it looks like a forsythia kind of. It's native. It's related to them, and uh, it has white flowers. I'd say it's prettier though than uh, forsythia. Okay, service berries, right? If you uh, if you go into the woods or the roadsides and you see the first plumes of uh, spring flowers, it's probably going to be service berries. We've got about 10 species in the Ottawa area. These are the two ones that have become kind of tree-like, and they're both really beautiful at flowering. The one on the left is downy service berry and probably flowers a little bit better. But the one on the right, which is smooth service berry, has bright red leaves at the same time as the flowers, and that can be very strikingly pretty as well. So you can't go wrong with service berries, and these two are not planted all that often, and they're very pretty. Canada plum that I've grown myself from those seeds I shown earlier, flowering in my yard last spring. I mean, it's just like the cherry and plum festival in my yard now, thanks to this. That's only about seven years after I planted it. Okay, I'm going to end it there. Just uh, this last year I'm showing is a Baroque, sort of like to, I guess, bookend the Swampet Oak I showed at the beginning. And again, after the ice storm, I was thinking of trees like this, right? So a lot of the maples, like especially silver maple, got kind of disintegrated by that ice storm. Uh, here's a Baroque on Faraday Avenue near the uh, pedestrian bridge as it crosses the 417. And it's right over that house. And kind of if it was ever to fall, maybe it'd be bad news for that house. But the nice thing about trees, like some trees like oaks and hickories and some other trees that are strong wooded, they, they don't fall very often, right? You almost never see a big branch under a burrow because uh, they're almost like the geological feature. So I thought I'd show that I wouldn't be too afraid to be in that house because I think it'd probably survive uh, <laughs> decades and decades and decades of dropping a big branch. So thanks for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions at this time. So I think we have time for just a, a few questions. Um, we'll limit it because it is getting a bit late. And uh, is is Jeff still here? Uh, yeah, Jeff, if there's a, a question or two, maybe from um, our viewers watching online, um, we, perhaps you could log through that as well. Um, Anne, I think you had a question. Uh, I know this is something I would be inclined to want to do. When you come across a rare tree that's just sitting somewhere, not close to any other tree, do you ever feel like taking any seed from it? And like helping you along. Yeah, so the, the question, if uh, people online didn't hear that, was um, if you see a rare tree, maybe it looks like it's wild and it's sort of like the last one in its area, maybe if the population was uh, disappearing, do I feel a urge to keep its genetic, uh, uh, you know, its genes alive basically by growing it intentionally? And the answer is absolutely yes, right? So for example, I strongly felt that when I uh, started seeing those swamp white oaks last summer, uh, south of Winchester, uh, the red spruces that I talked about tonight, um, that white oak that I mentioned that's extremely isolated near Reveler Conservation Area. Uh, so the, the answer is definitely yes. And uh, I think there's a lot of value in that because while species are species and they're all fairly close related, it's well known that um, in a species that has a geographic range of any size, you do get differences along that range, right? I'll give one example, the tree we're looking at right now, the bur oak, the scientific name is macrocarpa, meaning big fruit. And that, that name is a good name if you go south. So if you go to like Windsor, Ontario, the fruit might be the size of like a tennis ball almost, like golf ball to tennis ball, big fruit. In Ottawa, you're lucky if you get ping pong ball a lot of the time. It's like, it's a, it's like a race of the species. As, and as, as you go north and you have a shorter growing season, it's adapted to grow a smaller fruit. And the name almost makes no sense anymore for macrocarpa. So the answer is definitely yes. And I think there's all sorts of scientific reasons to do that. But also there's maybe just more... Uh, it, uh, there's almost like a, what, what's the right word, right? Like, uh, like almost like a pity that this is the last one and it might just disappear. You want to not 
see a local wine go extinct. So yeah, kind of scientific and uh, emotional, I suppose. Good place, Owen. Great talk, by the way. Thank you. Really awesome. Another question? Yes. I think we found hazelnut in the So have I ever found beaked hazelnut? Yes. So um, beaked hazelnut is actually pretty common as an understory shrub in the Ottawa area. Um, and so I didn't show it tonight, um, but it, you can find it fairly easily, especially on sandy soils, things like that, um, or just like acidic soil, often like, you know, La Rose Forest, for example, it's dominant. Uh, the, the one I did show the American hazelnut is really rare in Ottawa, but not rare, for example, in other parts of North America, right? So both are present. Beaked hazelnut is common. Uh, American is rare right Ottawa. Good question. Because the beaked hazelnut comes from my home area in the side. Ah. And I was wondering how was the range of that plant. Okay. The beaked hazelnut has a very large range. Uh, so it's common here, like I was saying. It also stretches far to the west as well. So much of North America, actually, including Saguenay. So it goes it goes pretty far north in a lot of areas too, but um, much of North America. Huge range. And perhaps one last question. <laughs> Um, the National Capital Commission has produced a really remarkable publication. I think it's called Remarkable Trees of Ottawa. And they've documented a really large specimen of trees in a driveway in their park. And they, but there's discussions on each variety of tree and what, whether they're native or not. But I refer to here that the are reading, so this is a history of a tree that's here in Ottawa or if it's native. So it's a real interesting forestry history of Ottawa, but also tells you where you know, the maps that show where these individual trees are that act so what the tree stuff. There's one like the big down tree that uh, I met here that I was in that one of the trees that was in the So it's a really neat document about the urban forest in Ottawa. Um, there is one really large uh, elm that was planted on the Kremlin Drive, Seen it. which still exists, and I think it exists because it's in front of Douglas Fulton's house, so I think it got a lot of special attention. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, his house was torn down when they tore the house down, they scratched the bark of the tree, but it's still alive. I also do the in gardens at Manson, and we have a um, some of them are native plants, and we have the seed for an area one time in question as well. And we also have a buffalo berry, which started with a shrub and now it's a tree. <laughs> so, this is one you know. Then, when was the NCC publication published? Really recently, I didn't know that. Years ago, I, I loved it so much, I never got a copy. You can buy it if you get it in the geographical design, which is a copy of the real fall. Okay, thank you, Lynn. And I'll just take the mic for a minute. So, uh, Jeff, any questions from that that you that we should be sharing from our online audience? No, yeah, thank you. Thank you. We're online. There's one question about: do, are there any other suppliers that you recommend for these trees? Are there any suppliers that you'd recommend for these trees? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are little mom and pop uh, suppliers that can be pretty good. The problem, if there is a problem with that, is uh, supply is just low. So I have a theory about this, right? So I say this a few times, so excuse me if you've already heard it. My, my theory about um, getting more biodiversity planted. So something you might hear a lot is, uh, oh, I wanted to plant a swamp white oak, but I couldn't find one. So I, I planted something else. Uh, okay, that, that's fair enough, right? But let's say you actually wanted to change that, right? Uh, taking swamp white oak as an example. Um, if, let's say you, you, especially if a group of people, right? If you have some uh, clout or just, you know, purchasing power, you can say to a supplier, I want to, or suppliers, uh, maybe, maybe make it competitive. I want to plant this, that, and the other that is not available today. Uh, so how about, I put a deposit down and you grow it for me. And upon receipt in five years or what, you know, three to five years of, uh, you know, say a, a thousand of this and 200 of that, um, I will pay you the rest of the money or whatever. And I will plant it. I, Cause I think we're kind of stuck in a time to some degree now where it's like such and such is never available and never will become available. 
<laughs> and uh, despite the best efforts of some smaller outfits, which are increasing in size, and of course the Ferguson Forestry Centers and places like that, but they can't keep up with it. I think we're at a point where the understanding is there more or less, and it's increasing. And uh, the availability currently has not kept up, kept up with that too well. So I would suggest if you do want to plant some of the plants that I showed tonight or other ones that I didn't show, uh, don't be shy about it. T tell growers you want that and you'll pay for that. And uh, that usually speaks volumes, I think, especially in, you know, so you might not get it this spring, but you can have it in spring 2027 or whatever, right? So I recommend taking that long game approach. It's not just, it's not always this spring that matters. It's the next one, the next one, the next one. And then eventually you get that biodiversity, right? So yeah, that's my take on it. So we're gonna close the meeting for tonight. Oh, and it's my job at the end of the meeting to also thank you so much on behalf of everyone here and everyone online for this amazing talk. Um, you truly are an ambassador for trees and I've learned so much tonight and I'm sure everyone has as well. Uh, particularly your deep knowledge of native trees and um, the work you know at, at, at the, the, the work as well around invasive tree species. So anyway, on behalf of everyone, a big, big thank you. <laughs>